for Type 40, we're a Doctor Who podcast on the Fandom Podcast Network. It's the show where we take an in-depth and closer look at this beloved television series, the spin-offs, the merchandise, even the fandom itself. Doctor Who's gone from homegrown, family favourite to international entertainment legend and shaped the landscape of science fiction and fantasy for well over five decades along the way. Now step into this TARDIS and share this journey together here with us on Type 40. Hello, yes, welcome. Welcome back. Put your feet up, take off that mask, even, and relax. I am your host, Dan Hadley, regular Type 40 pilot, and yes, Birmingham's King of the Geeks, yet lifelong Doctor Who fan, just like you. Well, perhaps, but perhaps not. It could be you're a lot newer to the Hooniverse, and uh, Type 40 is still the podcast for you because there's no gatekeeping here, only conversation, fun. And games, and we're all suitably socially distanced, everybody. Yes, here we are now in August 2020, reconnecting with an update, a sequel, if you like, to one of the year's most popular shows that we've put out. So this is the the lockdown era, part two, part ducks, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, I couldn't possibly reopen my bubble, could I, without bringing back my original Bubble Buddies. <laughs> first of all, God, that sounded a lot better in my head. <laughs> yes, first of all, it's uh, Sheffield's original Time Lady. Always our number one, Sarah Starry Eyed Girl. Graham, welcome home. Thank you. It's very happy to be back. <laughs> it feels an age. It does, doesn't it? Have you got a Doctor Who mask yet? I haven't, but I am getting one. I, I've, I've seen one with Daleks on, so I am. Um... Yes, I shall be getting that. Yeah, it's got to be a Doctor Who one. Although I've yeah. seen a really cool um, face hugger one that was quite <laughs> tempted <laughs> by. But I thought, I can't really just walk around the supermarket with that. I might freak some people out. Yeah, they would stare in Iceland. Definitely, <laughs> they would. <definitely. laughs> and sinking into the, the other chair with uh, his usual sort of casual abandon, it can only be the freaking awesome figure of the rabbi from another planet, Svila Betkin. Good to see you again, mate. Good on dog, how are you? Good, how are you? I just imagine Iceland, you, in, in, in the country Iceland. I was going to say the Nordic people, I don't think would mind a face <laughs> they, they, They're all very private, I find. Uh-huh. They, they, they will be like, that is what you want, that is what you want. It does not matter. Have you ever been to Iceland? It's very much like that. I haven't, no. They're not like that in the supermarket, are they? Sue? They're like that everywhere. They're, they're <laughs> like, the, they're like the, uh, the, uh, the landscape. Hello, and very polite and welcoming as well. This, this, this really is this very nice place. You're a very well-travelled man, though, aren't you, Rabbi? I've been, I've, I've been about a bit, you <laughs> know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yeah, enough of that. I mean, you've travelled, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm back, yes. Here we go again. We're going to have some fun over the next hour or so. But, yeah, before we open up, the whole lockdown thing, I must very quickly run through a couple of our fixed points. Those fandom podcast network essentials, each and every edition of our show, past, present and future, is up on the fandom podcast network's own master feed at fpnet.podbean.com and fpnet on the Podbean app. You can search and uh, play us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play and stream us on iHeartRadio. Whichever of those you're listening to us on, you can let us know what you think of it all through our social media presence, Instagram and Twitter, type 40 Doctor Who or go get yourself some daily Doctor Who goodness with our fearless companions in Type 40's lively Facebook group. That den of delights and Daleks filled with contributions from generations of fans. Come and find us, come and have a chat. There's links to all of it in the show notes. Oh, spoiling everybody again, Sarah. When we last spoke, it was hard to know where it could possibly all end, or even if it would end. Because week by week, for a couple of months, we'd witnessed this sort of big pulling together of the whole of the Doctor Who community, probably against the odds, <laughs> considering what had been on TV recently. Fans and pros alike, in the face of COVID-19 and lockdown, it was from the platform of Twitter from which it sort of sprang Fans were were following Doctor Who magazine's roving reporter, Emily Cook, to discover which episode of the post-2005 stuff she'd selected in this sort of totally unofficial, yet at the same time official, repeat season. It really captured people's imaginations, didn't it? And sort of marshalled, gathered the troops. Even those of us, such as myself, who couldn't quite keep up with the watching of the episodes on screen and reading the tweets at the same time, it was still, because it was such a unifying experience, 
yeah, there was still this sort of fever, really, of finding out which episodes that Emily had selected for us all to sort of uh, revisit and explore again. <laughs> all the reminiscing and all the rewatching it was very, very infectious. I think it's, it's the closest we could get in the present day to something like The Five Faces of Doctor Who repeat season when I was little. The last time we dropped out an episode, it's, we ought to have to be... <laughs> what was it? Last time on Type 40. That was it. We ought to have one of those captions. When we dropped out that last episode, it was the very day the focus had fallen onto human nature and family of blood from Doctor Who series 3 in 2007. So we timed that just right. The rabbi, he's cut his hand over his face already. We haven't even started talking. Yes, it was late April. Is it? Oh, oh that how it's been? I've only been four months. It feels like I've been at war. Well, like, yeah, does, I've been well been in many respects. I've been in the trenches. <laughs> Oh, and on Twitter one day, what a mistake. The joining in over on Twitter was, was the director, Charles Palmer, and the writer, Paul Cornell. Uh, things went awry fairly quickly that evening. But it turned out that although... It's like, you know, when they, uh, you scratch a record. And <laughs> you go, what happened? <laughs> It was. It was Can that you, sound effect you get wasn't yeah, it, on the radio it was. shows. Like, <laughs> like that. I'll have to try and drop that in somewhere. <laughs> it really, really was. Because I don't think anybody expected the major draw of that event had to be this superb Doctor Who writer sharing his process and maybe the odd sort of deleted scene or, or vague idea that he never sort of developed about what many would consider to be his very, very best work on the show. But the fact is that masses of the target audience joining in the tweet along that evening couldn't actually read his contributions at all. So the tide really turned that evening, and this wasn't the fault of anybody involved in the actual tweet along, such as Emily Cook. People were confused as hell. How on earth did this happen, as you understood it, Rabbi? How did it all come to pass? <laughs> I mean, wait, what a different <laughs> universe we're living in! Like, I can't, you, well, everything you're saying was real. And like, oh my God, I forgot how good it was. It, everybody it was really so was, nice. Yeah. Whichever but, side of the things that well, divide us as Doctor Who fans, yes, everybody was being nice to one another. By the end of that evening, we were divided, weren't we, into two camps. Yeah. Those who Paul Cornell had blocked on Twitter and those who he hadn't. The majority, I think, <laughs> I think it was... Uh, Probably two thirds in favour of the people that he blocked, because of course, if somebody blocks you on Twitter, it's one of the major social network platforms. If somebody blocks you, you can't see what they're tweeting. You can't interact with them in any way, uh, but you can see. You'd be able to see Charles Palmer's tweets back, for example, wouldn't you? So it's the equivalent of only being able to hear half a conversation. Mm. That's a very strange way. Connect with the audience. Audience. Yes, to connect with your audience, to relate, and to celebrate content such as this that's something that had already been so inclusive but it had actually st stuck a bit of a sticking plaster or maybe even yeah. a plaster cast on the healing bones and tissue of, of fandom itself were you watching that night did you do that tweet yeah. long and watch I, I did and I, I wasn't blocked I was one of the few that wasn't blocked but Me I kind of either not until a couple of nights later I kind of wish that I had <laughs> been after what I'd seen uh -huh. <laughs> It, it really marred it because obviously I'm trying to like follow what's going on, yeah. and then in between, I'm getting I'm seeing tweets and retweets from people saying I can't see what's going off, what am I missing? And oh, poor Cornell's blocked me, and it, and it just completely mm -hmm. took the focus away from the episodes we were watching because there's so many people were confused and getting upset. And then other people were getting on board because I saw, um, I followed Gareth Roberts and he chimed in on it and he was like, you know, I'm really enjoying seeing all the tweets from people say, finding out that the block from Paul Cornell. So he, he had kind of, I do like had, his Twitter. I do like Gareth Roberts. So yeah, he had a Very cheeky playful, little, and, and yeah, and he just, um, yeah, talk about raining on the parade. It, it just, but it ground to a halt and that's before we got to the, you know, the extra content i was convinced that you know Ellie cook had done this out of the goodness of her heart she was acting in the interest of dr yeah. fans but the minute cornell got involved it was suddenly there was an agenda behind everything that had been organized you know he was quick to say that let's all remember 
well, we've got to thank for this. It's Chibnall. No, no, it's not Chibnall. You, you know. He thanked Chris Chibnall really sort of a very kind of broad way, didn't he? He didn't mince his words at all. No. He, he made sure that we all acknowledged Chris Chibnall in some way. But, of course, Chris Chibnall was no part of any yeah. of this yeah, whatsoever. Yeah, I don't even think he was aware it was going on to begin with. But, you know, and I also felt, I found that really disingenuous and also quite insulting actually to what Emily had been doing because she'd set everything up she'd got in touch with people uh you know she'd brought the you know the, well, not guests but you know what I mean she included people and got things set up so they could join it was kind of like her baby and it just felt like it had been snatched yeah the initiative was all hers wasn't it mm. and I think it's important for us to say you know you've you've met Paul Cornell I've never had any dealings with him oh, yeah. I'm sh- I'm sure that he he didn't do that with malice and had, hadn't really considered the impact uh, of his actions and the way because the way he manages his own personal social media is of course his business that's completely fine he may be a writer and he may be involved in the community but just like everybody else mm-hmm. he's got every right to manage it mm-hmm. as he sees well i mean i would have thought but, if you've been if you've been asked to be involved on a project like this you don't have to use your personal twitter account because there's quite a few people who don't have Twitter? Graham Graham Harper didn't, or Matt Smith didn't, and he just and but they set yeah. up an account for those who didn't have one, so they could share. That'd have been perfectly fine. There would have been no problem. Yeah. Willingness and imagination to work with the established formula in the spirit of which it mm-hmm. had been launched and, and and grown by Emily. This is, this is why, why why I disagree with you, okay? Because he's not a private person; he's a public person. He's part of founder. He's a public person. He, he's got his he, tick mark, he isn't he? He has to, he's, that, that, that's a responsibility. And I think mm. it, that I, if that wasn't the case, we, we wouldn't be in the dire straits we are now. For him to, I mean, we talked a moment ago about him thanking Chris Chibnall and, and seemingly not, not mentioning Emily. He, seemed, he didn't seem to acknowledge her at all. I'm sure he did in we, private. Exactly. But... And, then, and then the stories were just so designed to meet a Chibnall agenda, like so transparently... I mean, like, listen, he wrote Jodie's Doctor very authentically in that she was a moron that, uh, <laughs> that released Daughter of Mine from, a, uh, from her prison, yeah. an unrepentant Daughter of Mine who was a psychopathic killer who uh, 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 was then going to be left in a highly populated area on her own, yeah, without any, any guard, guardship on her whatsoever. You say it like that, like it's really silly, which of course it, it's, it really is. Yes, th- that was only part of, of course, Mr Cornell's conduct on that evening, complemented these two new pieces of fiction that he delivered to fandom. They acted as, as the sort of the bread to the uh, the filling, didn't they? If you look on Human Nature and Family of Blood as the filling, two bits of bread that sandwiched it. Honestly, I would say the Jody story, more than sandwiching it, and, and this is... Uh... Maybe a coarse analogy, but I think a more accurate one. If somebody was into, uh, um, uh, you know, an activity in which one defecated on you yeah. and you enjoyed that, then that defecation would be that story. Putting that in, into sort of into literature, yeah, because he describes one as a prologue and one as an epilogue. Yeah, the epilogue was objectively awful. <laughs> so, oh it, my god, I would much rather not have the epilogue, and uh, it was just the because it, it thing caps ever. off that conclusion that we all responded to and remembered like thirteen years on. I mean, most Doctor Who of that time is very mem- memorable, but that finale, that closeout to that episode, that conclusion that they bring the plot and the characters to is particularly strong, but with Paul Cornell's new epilogue, which you know you have to take seriously. It has an officialness because it's right. written by the same guy. He has the thir- the thirteenth Doctor go back to visit that the little girl that the Doctor's trapped in the mirror, doesn't he? And basically undo it all and forgive, undo, sorry, the moral crimes, would you say, of the tenth Doctor and earlier incarnations, who it turns out have also been visited How's in between. How is it a moral crime not to let the psychopathic supervillain loose on a, on a defenceless population? How I I, I, Explain to me the crime involved in not... In, like, oh, here's Hitler. Have fun. Go play. Like, <laughs> what? Oh, by the way, I'm giving you superpowers as well. Oh, okay then. It's the equivalent of Chief... Of the equivalent, sorry, of Chief Brody in Jaws just coming up to the shark five, ten minutes before the end and, and dropping the harpoon or whatever it is and saying... Actually, yeah, fair play. Help yourself. Fair play. <laughs> direct you know, and direct you, you the shark to the beach. Victory, mate. Yeah, you've eaten all my friends, but what the hell? 
the actual story itself is completely stupid. It's ludicrous. But to me, it was just Paul Cornell moving with the tide in these current times and deciding to have one big advert to say, I'm free, Chibnall. Come and hire me, Chris. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the motivation behind it. It wasn't, you know, literary purposes and very in keeping with what's been going off. I mean, I hope he gets a bloody episode out. Of it, really? well, I mean, it, it worked really <laughs> I mean, hard. God. I mean, yeah. Give, give him that. Yeah, um, but yeah, the you know bloody the hell. idea of the thirteenth Doctor letting her out is just absolutely ridiculous. It's out of character for the Doctor. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, okay, so 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 when idiocy is a character's idiocy. calling card, yeah, and, and the tone of it, the, the way the girl—I mean, and they even got the girl yeah. back, didn't they, to do the voice, to the way she had said. Um, I should be free to be left to my own fate, like I should have done oh, in the first like, place. Okay, and I'm just now like, oh, shut up. Rabbi, where's the silver line to this cloud, my friend? I know okay, got... so so there, there is, fortunately, I wrote an epilogue to the epilogue. Thank God. That, uh, and I had my neighbour, he's, he's a voice artist, he read it, I put music behind it, it did illustrations. It yeah, I cool. saw that, it but... was really good, it was fantastic, Rabbi. I have a theory that all the doctors take time cleaning up after Jodie's messes. Yeah, messes. <laughs> you know, I, go, I imagine they all meet and say, oh, I better take care of it. And they all take... So the seventh doctor arrives and he's... Uh, he essentially is put... He's, he creates a pocket of time that this is just going to be swallowed into so it won't be real. Because uh, it was stupid. And I just I just imagine that's what uh, the doctors do. You know, yes. I think if she's a real doctor... The best people I know, these are absolutely the best people I know, uh, have a very large family and they're all wonderful. And they have a severely handicapped uh, boy. And he's never going to have a life left alone. So thank God he's always got this support group of his whole family. So like, he's going to be fine his whole life. I know he's yeah. going to be absolute kid. He's going to be absolutely fine his whole life because his whole family is wonderful, right? And they're all going to look after him. That's how they view Jodie's doctor. She's a mo- I mean, like, they have to go like, look, I mean, really? I mean, I, I can't imagine Tom Baker's doctor. You have to say, oh, I better go fix it. And then quietly <laughs> put back the human race, you know, after being decimated by the Cybermen or whatever thing that she, I mean, like, how is it she hasn't killed a slew of people? Could, yes. like, she would have done. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? This was a massive yes. professional flirt. It tried to be more than what it was. You could see him trying to go for this big, like, exploration of mercy. And I, I've seen other people, I've seen, like, Emily and other people try and desperately, you know, defend. <laughs> Prop it up a little. <laughs> and there's not, you know, we've had, you know, we've had a lot of exploration with mercy. And that <laughs> doesn't even come close. It makes no sense at all. Lisa Bauman was quite good in the prologue, I thought. Oh yeah, she's always, she's always yes. good as Bernice Summerfield. The illustration was good. I'm not going to take that away Rachel, from them. Rachel Scott, one of my favourite artists at the moment, absolutely superb work. And yes, help is at hand from the rabbi. So if you want to read his epilogue to their epilogue, we'll make sure that is in the show notes, and you can cleanse. The season did continue, and things did rally somewhat. First of all, next was a a whole short geared around Dalek. That seminal. Rob Shearman story from 2005, a short film called Sven and the Scarf, made by Dr. Andrew Ireland, who made the Mission to the Unknown remount last year. Now, oh, we did had... I didn't know he did that. Oh, that, he that, did that, that was yeah. really good. Yeah. We had Andrew in that week, myself and Simon Horton talked to Andrew at some length about how he put that together, how he, he wrote it, how he filmed it all himself in his garage, and we reviewed it extensively with the man present. So, yes, over to you two. You weren't here then. What did you think about that one then, Rabbi? Meh. Yeah, you know, the shine and the magic had gone. It really had, and I okay. didn't want it to, but it was like, eh. Okay. Okay, is that the one where they have like stuff on the scarf and That's they're looking the one, at it? Yeah. I, it wasn't offensive, but it wasn't thank you for the effort. I liked uh, Mission Unknown, that was good. He's a good he's a nice man, Andrew. He'll he'll like it. I, I, how about you, Sarah? I really enjoyed it. And you, you know, it was nice to have something that wasn't animation. And obviously you're, you're limited to what you can do. That's true. That is but true. there was a there was a lot of Very love. There was a lot of love in there and yeah. It made me chuckle. I, I love Dolly. It's a brilliant episode. And Robert um, Sheerman, delightful guy. I did get a little bit of a conversation with him. Um, I, I love Dolly so much. And I loved it, you know, his contributions, what he said about how he, how he came up with Dolly. Because obviously it was kind of based on his story, Jubilee, for Big Finish. But um, it was the fact that he'd 
sat down with his wife and she had gone through everything silly about the Daleks. And it's like, right, I'm going to write a list and we're going to tick it off and I'm going to sort it out. And boy, did he sort it out in that episode. And also that day, they did a big finish, did like a lockdown thing and they started doing group listens and that went really oh, well. Yeah, I, did, I just didn't understand how that would work because I could, I could watch and do something else at the same time. <laughs> I can't listen and do something <laughs> at the same time. Are you crazy? Yeah. Um, means I can get this much done. Are you re- yeah, I didn't do all of them because, you know, there's only, every, they started cropping up, didn't they, everywhere, and, you know, there's only so much yeah. time. It was nice to go back to just having a nice chat and geeking out, and he posted some pictures when he was little, dressed up as the doctor, and it was really sweet. And I, if, if we went, if we went back nature. and did that instead of uh, the Cornell one, everything would have been wonderful. Yeah. Then was it the week after it was the Zygon to put, and I think that's when it started to get. I don't think that yes. was the right story. That was Peter Harness, wasn't it? It was called the Zygon Isolation, and starred Ingrid Oliver back as Osgood, a character I have always been a, largely indifferent to. I like. I think Ingrid Oliver plays her well, but yeah, I, I've never really felt it. I did quite enjoy that short. I don't remember. I mean, listen, she's much point. better on uh, on on audio than, than mm. on video because, like, on audio she doesn't sound so silly, and then when you see it, she's got the Tom Baker scarf and it's like, like that's just <laughs> that's just silly. Yeah, it takes you out of it. It's not very it, good. It for... And so when you see it, you're like, eh. it worked. It worked so for the. Her, she's fine. It worked for the 50th anniversary special. I the joke kind of. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I didn't like the short. I, I do like Ingrid Oliver and I like Osgood. It left me cold. I, I didn't think it was funny. Because he said something about that. Oh, no, no, it wasn't, like, it wasn't funny. She was talking about I... making a bed 400 times or something like that. Oh, yeah. right. That's they did it in lockdown. Then, How let, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because there are very few, even though Doctor Who has got this wonderful, whimsical mm. edge to it, there are actually very few of even its most capable writers that can write that brand of comedy mm. with a small c well aren't they and in that instance i don't think peter harness is one of them no. bless you peter um so yeah it, it wasn't it was okay and then of course they had to tie it to current doctor who and as soon as that happens i just don't want to know yeah i can't how what was the, the tie into current doctor who i can't remember it started she was texting us oh, God, yeah. Yeah, forget like, exactly as soon as you bring her in like, listen, for, look, I have an extreme view, okay? So I'm like, <laughs> I'm not fair, but like, whenever you bring her in, it's like, oh, God, it's like nails on a chalkboard. It, it ruins everything. Yeah, it's just like, but it's like, like somebody just suddenly pouring ice cold water on you. It just. <laughs> right. <laughs> and for what? what? Like, really? And just, numerous like, of these shorts did do that somewhere they either mentioned. Starting that, then. Sort of starting, and it was like, oh, yeah. just enough already. The next one was Pompadour written by Stephen Moffat and voiced by Sophia Miles, coming back as Madame du Pompadour after a 14-year break. Accompanied with some nice visuals from the episode The Girl in the Fireplace. It didn't break the mould, did it, that one, Sarah? It was pretty much what you'd expect from yeah. Sarah. It, uh, from it was nice. I mean, it was nice. To, it's always nice to have Moffat on Twitter. I think he's wonderful. And, and he's so cheeky on that. Um, I love seeing Sophia Miles back, and she really embraced it and I think enjoyed you know the attention from fans there was so much life in in her vocal delivery wasn't there yeah she was she was, yeah, no, she, she great she was recording herself yeah. watching it as well and that was really nice it, it seemed to go back up I think after yeah, that I found myself really again at this point I don't know if it's because Lashina come off but I just found myself really struggling to care and I wanted to I really wanted to I thought it was like it just seems as like I didn't really need didn't really it, I don't know. I'm glad they did it. I don't want to. I don't want to like disparage them for the time they put in. Good it didn't. For them. It didn't shine any new light or anything, did it? That, yeah, that yeah exactly, exactly. At least it wasn't connected to the current era. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Next, it was a story called The Descendants of Pompeii, a little thing, a sequel to The Fires of Pompeii, which brought back two of the cast members just to sort of uh, reprise their roles, sort of, as uh, descendants of the family from that 2008 story. And I thought that was quite good as well. That did pretty much what I, I was expecting it to do, but it was nicely written. The, I think the whimsy in that was right. I just don't remember it. That was the Skype call between the mother and the daughter. Well, well, what happened in it? What it turns out, the daughter had been tracing her family tree through like ancestors.co.uk 
Com or something or other, and that was all right. left open on her desktop. And so she was right. telling telling her mother how the fact that she was a policewoman while she was a teacher, and that all the, these careers had kept recurring throughout their family in past generations. That's interesting. Okay. I don't they, remember it at all. I'm like, no remember it. Something like the, the grandma said that she thought there was a guardian angel watching over the family. And at the end... A lot, at of, the, the, a lot of them did that, didn't they? They mythologised the Doctor a lot. Yeah, it was nice. It was okay. I mean, I, I like the actresses. And again, I think it depends on who you get in and if some of them were really interacting with the fans. Tracy Childs was one of them. She kind of threw herself mm. into it. And I think... So that, that kind of won me back a little bit. Um, Is that the same Tracy, Tracy Charles that plays uh, Klein in Big Finish? Yes. It's the same woman. Okay, fine. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Cause, uh, yeah, she, she used to be in Howard's Way years and years ago. They brought David Tennant and Catherine Tate in as well to comment on that one. So that was quite nice. I remember that. Yeah, they were fun. They, they were, were really fun. So it kind of felt like it was... Um, yeah, but still, at that, at that point, it's kind of like when the party's over, it's still going... Mm. That was the last one I was part of. I, I didn't watch any of the others. Like, but obviously, at that point, I was getting things up into me on Twitter and I'd had enough of that. You yeah. took, yeah, you yeah, took yeah. your I, leave I, of Twitter I, I, because I, I, the, I, the tide largely turned, didn't it? Just yeah. as, as you're saying, Rabbi, a shadow was cast across the whole of fandom again, really. And it wasn't long before the the cracks that had, that had really been put in by the human nature business, they started to deepen, didn't they? And, and, oh, and, I tell you. And before you know I like, it, fandom came Now you say party. it, because like, you live through it, you don't mm-hmm. notice it. It's like, it's shocking how bad it is. I, as you may pick up, I I'm not a fan of the current era. I'm not. I, 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 if you like it, I'm, I'm happy for you to like it. Then now there's this belief that if you don't like it, that you, you hate anybody who mm-hmm. makes it or likes I know yeah. um, if you got 10% of the pleasure from a from a Jodie episode of Doctor Who as I have from any episode of Doctor Who I'm happy for you because it was around that time that side of the fandom was like well why aren't we having anything to do with Jodie and Emily had said that there was a reason yeah, why she plan, couldn't. Plans have been put in place, but there was a reason why she. There was a right, right, right. And there was I, a practical I, I reason she got why beat they couldn't. Up as well from every side. But again, just look at where we are now. Then four months ago, I was rooting for Doctor Who magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my! Now I'm like going, oh, I wish it dies. In no time at all. Mm-hmm. It's yes. just so sad. Things escalated really quite quickly, and it did seem yeah. to get out of out of poor Emily's control because at the end of the day this was something that she was doing out of the kindness of her heart yeah, in her was, it, in her spare well, time well. and people were asking the strangest questions of her and this is people on all sides of the equation so i can only right. ima- imagine what she must have been thinking particularly when she was actually producing this content which was clearly intense and that was love that yeah. was such love yeah. and e- e- even though i didn't like the jody connector it's so clear it's done with such love, you know. It, it, it was. She had I done mean, so much for fandom and and for the Doctor magazine because it it was already struggling. I think she did give it a little yeah. bump, and then she got that. That, that would have been. Even yeah. though she's not the editor, she's given it a face and a voice again, and, and gave it some eye. Give us some idea of what it actually stands for. Because when Tom Spilsbury was the editor, it it did have a definite voice, and you knew what it stood for. And although Marcus Hearn is a, a very experienced editor, there is clearly a different culture there now. I don't know, but I get the impression that the people who who are on staff there are very much backs against the wall and given very little to work with from Chris Chibnall. Well, so for Emily to to do this to the point where we could identify her as being somebody that was connected with Doctor Who magazine, even though this was in a different capacity made you more warm to the magazine again, as you say, right, want, want right, that to succeed, you know, want and it, that it, to endure, because we want Emily to do nice things, because she's a nice person. She, I, I, I've yes. got a lot of time for Emily, and she did all this, you know, she got that wonderful interview going with RTD and Moffat, because I did buy, I bought that issue, that was good. and then, that was a great but then issue. what happened in that very same issue, so we had that letter from Chris Chibnall about how, to, how long the production was and how they couldn't oh wait for it yeah. to be. And he whined and he whined and he whined. One step forward for the magazine and everything and then two steps back. <laughs> I was much more charmed by the next slice of lockdown goodness. I'm not much for poetry, but Stephen Moffat penned a little poem called Listen, a poem. And that I was found good. Surprisingly that was good. moving. 
Yeah, and it was just set to a, the the simplest of of pictures of Peter Capaldi as the as the Twelfth Doctor sat on top of the TARDIS while this thing was being yes, being recited. I did see that one. That that was really that good. Was that was really well done. Really, really nice. And for a guy, Stephen Moffat can be he can be a little verbose, can't he? And he can, and he can sometimes he can go too far with the comedy because he's a very very funny man. And I think sometimes he can fracture the Doctor Who universe with it. But he he kept it just. Right, to the point yeah, where I, I went back and listened to that again today before recording this just to make sure I could s- sort of remember it. It was being read by the Doctor when he was a small boy to the Twelfth Doctor. It was, you know, it was for all these different sides to it for such a, a, a short thing. So yeah, I really, really liked that. And there was also a, a sort of a motion comic there, a, a storyboard set to music. The, the images of Mike Collins, the, the storyboard artist and comic book artist, which and it, it was a story about Danny, Danny Pink when he was uh, cybertized. And it was called Fear is a Superpower, the idea of what's running through his oh, head. That wasn't bad was either, yeah. 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 I, did, I didn't mind it. It, it was but, okay. Yeah, but the, the, probably, yeah. The, the cybertized Danny Pink was one of the weakest parts of that season. Yes. I, I, didn't, I didn't really yeah. want to be reminded of that. <laughs> So. I'd forgotten a lot of the nuances of the story and the little, and the character beats of Danny Pink. I mean, I mean, other than cybertization, I, I quite liked him as a character. You Same know, I, I, it, he was in the uh, the Jake Dudman uh, Twelfth Doctor uh, Chronicles, and he was really good, really personal, and really well. And it made me appreciate how much I liked him as a character and how interesting his art was. Because essentially, the Doctor was just like insanely jealous of him the entire season. <laughs> I wasn't opposed to it at all. Well, he was a kid. Um, he was a kid. We knew what Danny Pink stood for, and although yeah. some of the writing back at then it wasn't the subtlest, it still made you believe that this character was a living, breathing yeah. person with all these different conflicting sides to right. him, he rather was, than a sort of. I think he was a missed opportunity. Group. I think I would have liked him to have been in the TARDIS a little bit because I just think he'd have been such a foil for the Doctor. Yeah, I, you're 100 percent correct. I do agree with you, especially that 12th Doctor, especially mm-hmm. in that season. Yeah, yeah, I 100 percent. It would it would have been great. They uh, slotted in an adventure in space and time in the middle of the week, but there wasn't any new content to go with that as such. We did get a nice direct to camera video, like a voicemail thing from David Bradley from what looked like his uh, dining room or something like that. But it was. Well, I don't even remember that. Why? What, what did it say? He just said thank you for watching and, uh, you know, hello, I'm David Bradley. I've played the Doctor sometimes and thanks for watching and thanks for donating to the You know, I like his Doctor by his first Doctor. I really do. I like the whole team. I really mm. wish they would film, like, missing stories in the they same may way. as well. They, yeah, in the, sa- in the same way they did uh, yeah, Mission Unknown. Just yeah. Marco Polo. Yeah, it would have been, been awesome. It would have been amazing. But the, like, that, 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 that point, that just made me angry again. I'm still real from the timeless children. So as soon as I saw like David Bradley as Hartnell, I was just like, just through justice for Hartnell. <laughs> I got fired up again. I, I, I am one of the, the few in, on this side of hand that absolutely adore Twice Upon a Time. If the Doctor's going to go anywhere, I can't think of a more doctory place to go than the Christmas Armistice in, in World War One. That is such a place that the Doctor would end up, especially, and this Doctor, well, yeah, that 12th Doctor was the ultimate, the most mm-hmm. doctory Doctor. And so if he's going to die, that would be the last place he goes, right? It's, it's exactly, I couldn't exactly agree right. with you more. In fact, I've only had, in the last 15 years, ideas for two Doctor Who stories, and one of them was about that football match. Maybe one day I, I, I have more of an appreciation for Twice Upon a Time when I found out that it was coupled together from nothing because Moffat and Capaldi had already left. But, yeah. uh, but you know what? I, I am so convinced that it's Piers Wenger behind her behind now. I think so, yeah. Yeah. He puts out some very strange statements, doesn't he, Mr. Piers he Wenger? He does indeed. He does he indeed. Really, I'd lo- he really I would does. love to interview him. That man, that oh, man has no grip <laughs> on reality. He, he has no idea what is going on. I, I was like to say, what does editorially... Uh, editorially uh, successful? successful? What does that actually mean? That me hated by the nation? Gee, I mean, really? <laughs> Apparently, there's a whole market for TV that people don't watch. So, can you imagine where it could end? You know, where what this could mean for consumer for consumer industries? We could end up with a whole line of, for example, food that people don't eat uh, yeah. and beer that people don't drink. It could just sit there. Um, oh yeah, tell yeah. you, this is sounds like we're going to conserve a lot because we can recycle. <laughs> but it will be editorial. <laughs> But it will be editorially successful, it, this brave it, yeah, new world that all, all organised by Pierce Wenger. 
Does that mean you're insane? Pierce, if you are listening to this, my friend, come on and, t- and talk about it. Come I would love us, to know. Come and tell us, get in touch with the rabbi know. or myself. We'd love to have you on the show. And we can, I mean, listen, uh, okay, this is how I interpret it. Why not make TV, like, for people again? Rather than, like, your little, tiny, twitter arty. There are about 45 people. That's it. <laughs> That's all there is. I mean, yeah, the fact is, a lot of this and a lot of the discussion, a lot of the discourse around it does come from Twitter. Mm-hmm. Less than 10% of the, of the UK population are actually on Twitter. So if you're listening to this and you you know you might be one of the sensible ones, you're not on this platform, you've never been on this platform, you don't really know what we're talking about with the uh, the watchlongs it did come from Emily's Twitter account. So well, we do have to touch on it. One of the the joys that I've found in it since I've been using it is it is quite a creative place, but that does seem to come at a cost. Some of the behavior and some of the things that that you do see on there. People just wouldn't communicate okay, but, like but you that. You know why you wouldn't on, see them in, 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 the, in the real world? it's not that you would get hit in the face if you did the stuff you do on Twitter. It's that you would be put in an insane asylum. I mean, could you imagine if you went into a laundrette and said, listen, you made a joke eight years ago. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like it. You're like, okay, could you leave, sir? Like, what? Well, yeah. And they're all like, like, what do you mean? And now, and I, like, you can all get, take everything so literally and get uptight about so much. It has bro- uh, broken down some of the walls between us and professional creatives actors producers whatever else and we can see that we're all just human beings we think of much the same things we've got the same kinds of people in our lives we've got a lot of the same pressures of day-to-day life on us as one another it demystifies people and even intellectual properties because obviously you do see these sort of great contradictions when BBC America are saying one thing for example BBC Studios are saying another BBC America misjudged this entire uh, lockdown tweet along situation completely as we spoke about last time they tried to sort of push their way in with with season 12 rewatches which which was shelved within 24 hours (laughs) that was absolutely Hilarious. Sorry, did I say hilarious? I meant, of course, tragic. Yet the all these new productions that we're talking about now, they reached somewhat of a head with something called Doctors Assemble. The the production set itself the task, didn't it, of creating an entire multi-doctor story. You know, because that is a big hit traditionally with all Doctor Who fans to bring all the doctors up to now all together in a short 15-minute film. Now, David Bradley was on board. He voiced the first Doctor, but all the other Doctors, and they didn't tell us this until quite late in the day, all the other Doctors were voiced by sound-alikes, weren't they, mm-hmm. from within fandom, or professional impressionists. People like Deborah Stevenson voiced the 13th Doctor in this. I think John Corshaw was involved. So name people, and people who had got a bit of reputation for doing this within fan circles. So it's a really, really tall order, Sarah. Who convinced you the least? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was okay. Because they were all there. Until yeah, okay. the, I really liked Deborah Stevenson, and to be fair, she actually did a better job of being Jodie Whittaker than Jodie Whittaker was. But um, well, she'd got le- less to work with than everybody else, hadn't she? I didn't think Nine was very good. Who did Nine? The very, very um, you know, the John Coleshaw doing Tom Baker is always a delight to hear. Yeah, it was okay. I wouldn't. It didn't live up to my expectations. I'll put it that it was way. nicely animated, wasn't it? There was because this one came with a fully CGI realized console room, and the idea was that the doctors themselves were all trapped somehow, but we could interact with them and see them and hear them interacting with one another yeah. through the various yeah, they, circuits they, they, and consoles. They, they, they were all trapped in some place that uh, distorted and warped their their voices, so they completely <laughs> unrecognizable. <laughs> you know it was. I, 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 and also, oh, look, bless her, the girl to Jody. Uh, really? I sound more like bloody Jody. <laughs> Who's that? I thought, is that Silverman? That was What's going on? It, it was okay. It, it was. You know, it was very pretty. The kids enjoyed it because it was quite funny. About the, they were looking at cat yeah. videos or something, weren't they? Oh, well done. Uh, listen, it, this would have been great if they hadn't hyped it as like you know, the first there was two thousand and one, a space oddity. Then they yes. were like they hyped it and hyped it to be the biggest thing ever. I certainly got the impression the way that they were banging the drum for it that a couple of the actual doctors would be involved. <laughs> that was earlier, yes. All the doctors only get a certain amount of of uh, our attention there, of our screen time. And so, as is always the case with multi doctor stories, they have to sort of boil them down really to what they are in essence. And a lot of Thirteenth Doctor fans were incensed by the way the oh yeah nobody was happy. 
<laughs> yeah, people like me couldn't stand it because 13 was there 13's fans were like what the hell nobody was happy it's because it exposed how thin the character is that's the truth of the matter yeah. there was nothing there I, and I can't remember who wrote the Doctor's Assemble I do apologise if you're listening I can't even remember I'm anything she did except going okay uh, it, boomer it like she a, said th- that's it okay boomer and YOLO and all this and that was pretty much it just sound bites really no actual personality it was like somebody heckling the rest of the Doctors yeah, well, that's, that's yeah, what yeah. she is. That's, that's, a very good yeah. Yeah. that's the perfect yeah. description. So, again, they might have bitten off a little more than they could chew there, but lockdown did continue and we did have more. But yeah, it's time for a short break now because we'd hate for you to miss out on some of the little morsels that the Fandom Podcast Network puts out either. Yeah, there are lots of other conversations going on across lots of other shows about all sorts of different f- uh, films and TV shows, all those fandoms that you could be into. Here's a few words about all of that. Then you can meet Sarah, the rabbi, and myself back here for more Lockdown Lunacy in a couple of moments. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. we like to continue to feed your ears by inviting you to listen to the Fandom Podcast Network and all of the other awesome shows we have to offer. It starts with our flagship show, Culture Clash, our weekly pop culture news podcast. Blood Kings, our Highlander podcast. Couch Potato Theater, our podcast celebrating our favorite movies. Time Warp, the fandom flashback podcast discussing a year in movies and our favorite pop culture topics. Enzo, the NFL podcast. Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast. Union Federation, our Star Trek and Orville podcast. Hair Metal, the 80s and early 90s rock metal podcast. Type 40, our Doctor Who podcast. Lethal Mullet, a 1980s and 90s action film podcast. What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. And our newest show, Making Treks, a new Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier with host Mark Newbold and Adam P. O'Brien. You can enjoy all of these great Fandom Podcast Network shows on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. Fandom Podcast Network is also on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook under Fandom Podcast Network. You can also email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter under Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. Yes, there's something for everybody there. And when you find your next second favourite podcast, and maybe you want to tell the world or the universe, help is at hand. There's merch to match. If you head over to the tpublic.com store and search for the Fandom Podcast Network storefront, there you'll find all the logos to all of those shows on T-shirts, hats, mugs, so much geek chic you won't know where to start. Treat yourself. Treat your other selves, come to think of it, and support the Fandom Podcast Network into the bargain so everybody wins. Yeah, speaking of other fandoms, everybody, the whole tweet along phenomenon was catching on. The Radio Times staged some Torchwood events with John Barrowman in tow. Imagine they must have really had to fought hard to get John Barrowman involved. Yeah, he was a <laughs> <Barrowman>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although he was so good, was he was brilliant. the highlight of it. Yeah, like, he, was great. he was so happy. Oh, I love John Barrowman. Just, he is, ha- so he is six foot of pure happiness he from is. top to toe. He, isn't he? he just radiates joy, really doesn't he? I think the fans got to pick the episodes on the Radio Times one, which is, you know, it's nice, nice touch. They did, uh, was it Life on Mars as well? That, that did work very Life well. Life on Mars, Wurzel Gummidge, Blake oh, Seven. Wurzel Gummidge? I missed there that. Wurzel Gummidge that. ones. And as you quite rightly say, Big Finish got involved. They were doing some Doctor Who ones. They were also doing some Blake Seven ones too. Fans, Doctor Who fans, were, as much as they were enjoying this, or a certain amount of us were, they were also a little bit disappointed because there was this big divide between the new and the and the classic series. People were asking for classic Doctor Who. Over a period of a few weeks, classic Doctor Who rewatches did spring mm-hmm. up. Certain people out there like TARDIS Monkey and our friend Jas Preet Singh, he was involved in, in a whole season's worth of them. But it didn't quite catch the same momentum. People put in a lot of effort. And Rabbi, you were involved in one, weren't you? In one of these waves of classic... I still am. We're still doing classic it. Classic tweet we did, like, we, 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 Every Saturday night, we do a classic story. We're going, yeah, we do each Doctor in order. 
Last night we did Planet of Fire. Next week we're doing uh, uh, Vengeance on Varos. And we just keep, nice. we do a different uh, Doctor each week. Because there was a push for it, wasn't there? Uh, Philip Morris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, Philip Morris, absolutely. The, the missing I mean, actually, episode hunter, I, he was pushing I, for I it. I mean, too. listen, I, I think it got a little bit tense at one point, which uh, I think is unfortunate. But I, I do feel it's somewhat tragic that, like, Russell T. Davis didn't lead a watch along of, of uh, City of Death, which is one of his favorite stories. Because that could have been wonderfully unifying and it could have brought new series fans uh, into the classic era. And that's the best thing. Like, maybe we can all just agree to like this bit. Anything <laughs> apart from these lows. Yeah, like, there's got to be something else here we all like. And we'll just yeah. look at but that. The problem is that the current run isn't fun. We want that escape, so is there's, there's no point in revisiting moments in recent history where you're miserable as sin, is there? Oh. You want to revisit a time where where you were happy and where the show was talked about, where it was what they used to call water cooler TV. Everybody was talking about. I believe that even though it's it's all come to pass now and there's no turn of the clock back, the classic show could have quite easily have been involved if you'd have picked the right stories. I, I think it was perhaps because some of them were were just too long and too ambitious for them to get people tweeting along for that length of time. And maybe the exclusive content, content was part of the draw as well. But I think you could have picked stories. You could have picked things like the Santaran Experiment, for example, or the King's Demons, or the Rescue. Shorter, 50-minute chunks mm. where the, the entire thing could be watched by the same audience, held their attention span. I'm sure that Maureen O'Brien would have been happy to have joined a, a mm. tweet along. If iPlayer had, had, had like put them on iPlayer for like a week, Mm-hmm. They'll just they'll put it, all they could do is get people watching it. You know that all that would happen. Yeah, people would watch mm-hmm. more Doctor Who and be happier. That's all. You know, and I'm sure contractually they they will be able to do that. And for example, I mean, three episodes of the Happiness Patrol doesn't really come to any longer screen time right. than Day of the Doctor. Yeah, especially yeah, when you yeah, think no. that they did start doing two parters like Human Nature and Family and Blood and Stolen Earth and Journey's <laughs> yeah, End. Point. And it, yeah, they could you could have you could have done it, missed opportunity really. But I'm glad you know that yourself have started doing them. And yeah, there were little groups that that were doing it. It, it was nice to have that included. There's something else I want to talk about because if there's one thing that embarrasses me on such as telethons is when they get people up out of the audience or the staff of a million supermarkets and they get them sort of singing or, or trying to be the cast of Hamilton or something like that. And we had something called the lockdown song Ooh, next, oh, uh, which which was... <laughs> yeah. this, was this was a tie to the Rings of Akatan tweet along. And the idea was, in case you've forgotten or blotted it out, this was a video bringing together over 300 Doctor Who fans into a virtual choir using the wonders of Zoom and Skype to bring those voices together. Uh, I'm st- it was I'm short. St- but I, love, I love the long song. I do. So do I. I was going to be part of it, actually, but things came up. But when I did watch it, I didn't think it was very good. It seemed to be more of a vehicle for the woman singing and just having them in the back. The focus seemed to be on her more than the quiet. Yeah, again, sincerely, if you're part of that and it was a little bit of a dream come true for you, then I'm absolutely thrilled for you. I I really hope that you you treasure the memory of being involved with it. And it is a lovely thing. Of course it is. There's uh, there's no account for taste, just ignore me. Rabbi, what did you think about it? Oh. Um, (laughs) Well, we can move on if you like, because there there was... I don't want to be mean. I keep saying (laughs) that, but like, oh. I think it it was a nice idea. I don't think it was executed as well as it could have been. Nice idea that time time had not, was not the right, it it, it would have been, it would have worked out better a couple of months earlier. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> the time of part of Britain passed, um, it was probably even more ambitious to do that than the Doctors Assemble, if truth be told, mm-hmm. and to make it sound as good as it sort of could have. Whoa! Did they do it live, or did they just put all the uh, um, no, videos no. together? They put them all together. Yeah, and I think that's part of the that's problem. Hard. Next up was something called The Secret of Novice Hame, which is a sort of an anime stylized oh, yeah. short story sequel to New Earth. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was written by Russell T. Davis, which is the that's the good news. But this also has kind of set fandom's tongues wagging, didn't it, for three or four days because it teased not just the fact that the Doctor could change gender, 
but could also become animals as well in the dialogue. Russell C. Davis does like to be playful sometimes like this, doesn't he? And the, the dialogue is very, it's sort of, it's very big, isn't it? It's very florid and it's it sounds mythic, but he does chuck these things in sometimes, doesn't he? Just like we had the Nissa and the Tegan, same-sex relationship I, I, last time. You know, there's many ways you can interpret it. And as Russell C. Davis is a good writer, it, he's not leaving me with one sole, in, uh, sole interpretation. Which will mm. be the obvious one. Yeah, I like. I give it a pass because Russell Davis, Russell Davis, you know, mainly. That's mainly why I give it a pass. Otherwise, it's talking about animals like you know the cat people. Anna Hope was back as novice Heyman, so that was yeah. Nice. But is, is, is he saying the dogs can regenerate into uh, one of those those one of those cat? I mean, Potentially, that's what they're saying. Potentially. I don't see why not. I don't see why the doctor hasn't regenerated into a draconian or. Mm. But they all just seem to be humanoid, so. Yeah, regeneration has got a bit more confusing over the last five years, I would I say. Think the only real problem that I had with that is I thought it was a little bit too long. It was 11 minutes long, and I think probably six yeah. minutes could have done it. Nice it artwork. Quite sweet. Uh, I thought it was lovely uh, artwork. It suits, yeah. it suits that world. It, it suits, suits the right. New Earth vibe. It was, it was nice. It got that whimsical feeling, and um, I, I just laughed. I thought it was hilarious because I interpret it as just one big troll to Chibnall. Because I just think RTD is Which so is cheeky, and yeah, it just it just made me. I, 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 I like to imagine that it. it happened during the David Tennant Tenth Doctor's world tour. You know when he would when he was visiting everyone. And like, let's visit, yeah, let's like visit Novice well. him as well. We'll just visit every right, yeah. well, every that, character. He does actually say that in yeah. the dialogue, yeah, because um, David Tennant did return to do some voice work yeah, on that, and, and um, certainly a, a good dozen or so lines. He did. It was it was nice to hear David Tennant. It was lovely to have RTD, but all it did was just make me think, oh, how good were RTD? Again, because he just, you know, like in 11 minutes... Temp Doctor seeing Novice Haim and, you know, that nice little moment where she was reunited with her parents because that's what the Doctor does. He does kind things like that. Yeah. It's the Doctor. And it was, and I just felt like, oh, I miss RTD. And she felt like such a complex character as well, just in those few minutes. Because it all right. takes place on her deathbed. And she talks about her life. So many shades of grey to it. And you can see that whilst the Doctor had been a key component on a couple of occasions in her life. It wasn't too saccharine at all. Mm. The only problem, I, I, like I said, I had was the fact that I thought it probably was a little bit too mm. long. Then some yeah, of the others were too I, short. I that. It, I, yeah, it, yeah. It, I, it was yeah, mostly harmless. That's how I, yeah. I would describe it. And I do like the idea, this, the, this thing that it put out there, that Novice Haim had been investigating New Earth as a thing, the fact that it had appeared in the same place as the old Earth. She dug under the surface of the earth and found something and then passes away before she can explain or explore what it may be and, and Russell T. Davis leaves that there for other writers and other doctors and showrunners maybe to pick up later on either on screen or in or on audio or in book form. I like it when they do that. I like it when Russell T. Davis does that. Oh, let's, mm. <laughs> let's clarify actually. I think it's great. I think he leaves people enough room that they could interpret that in so many ways. And I think that's one of the great gifts of the man. I think that's why he understands modern mythology better than anybody else, including including Stephen Moffat. And the final contribution did come shortly afterwards from Stephen Moffat. It's the beautifully titled piece called The Best of Days, performed by Pearl Mackey and Matt Lucas. This is supposed to have accompanied the final watch along of World Enough and Time and The Doctor Falls. And they, they even brought Murray Gold back. To do the music for this, it was a, a, a big yeah yeah no no, no one's going to get nobody in the entertainment industry is going to uh, avoid being in this virtue signal, which uh, <laughs> painfully was. What do you mean by uh, that, Sphi? <laughs> it was so it was, embarrassing. I didn't mind and it because like, I, I I do like I think I'm the only person who actually likes not. <laughs> No, I, no, I, I, I like that. I, 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 I like him. I like him. Sweet, nice. I liked everything apart from the messaging. Yeah, it was. It was on and the like, nose. Like the it for, was on the uh, nose. Yeah, the, the anti political parties that I, I think were a bit dodgy. Um, you know, to solicit for funds for them, and these part these political entities, they were a bit dodgy when you look at them. I, I don't know. Is he a bit? This was within days of the, yeah. the, the riots of yeah. early summer 2020 when all that was kicking off. A very scary time for, for people, particularly in America, a, conf a confusing 
time and upsetting time. And realistically, I think any writer, even as good a writer as Stephen Moffat, I think he should have resisted the temptation to, to yeah. put yeah. Yeah, yeah. a single I foot. I just think we needed I, escapism I think it, more than I anything think that's else. Just, it, it's too complex. I think issue. it really just highlighted what happens when you're political. As soon as that happens and you ain't got that balance. Uh, and I was quite sad that it didn't go ahead because I thought it robbed... Pearl Mackey of her moment to shine on Twitter because she's on Twitter. She's very active on Twitter. What, they, they didn't do the wash long in the end because uh, they they that, that annoyed me. They, I think somebody's skin colour is somebody else similar to somebody else's skin colour. Was, and the, um, and the, the part one who wasn't real gets turned into a Cyberman. Yeah, really? The, the, yes. Oh my God, like, Pearl Mackey is incredible in those two yeah. episodes. Yes, it was her yes. finest and it, work on yes. the show. It did, it did, it really, it did, it did them all a disservice, but particularly Pearl Mackey. Especially in that that second episode when she's waking up mm. and that whole thing when she doesn't realize she's a yeah. side man. Incredible. That is freaking, and that's some of the best I've ever, best character work I've ever seen a companion do in Doctor Who. And I've seen a lot of Doctor God, Who. she was so good. She should have yeah. either stayed an extra year or joined a she year did. earlier. Oh, I know. So, I so know. good. When, when she cries over... 12's body and she's just oh God, she's just yeah. so that, heart-wrenching that's the way it should have ended as well so beautiful but I still love twice one of the time <laughs> it, it's goes to it goes to show doesn't it for, for all there's excess to the way that Stephen Moffat wrote that character sometimes and people some people out there dislike her because of some of the writing and how on you know he would mention the fact that she was gay all the time but the fact that he did do that and we still love the character we still appreciate Pearl Mackey we still found her a breath of fresh air and the most relatable Doctor Who character in some yeah. years at that point probably since Donna absolutely fantastic stuff and she was great reading her role of, of the best of days I thought both mm-hmm. her and Matt Lucas were, were good fun doing it but yeah they put that out as, as was always the case shortly before what was supposed to be the final watch long tweet along of those two episodes but it was ultimately cancelled what had happened a few days earlier is when they'd announced it was going to be those two episodes as you quite, quite rightly say rabbi some people take exception to those two episodes because of the way uh, the bill character is treated amongst other things and and this section of fandom decided that they were going to schedule their own watch along directly opposite with under the under the hashtag another another hashtag Doctor Who Blackout supporting Black Lives Matter, and they selected a completely different episode. I think that was Thin Ice, mm. and the idea being that here's your alternative if you want to see something that we have chosen as being more reflective and more appropriate. I suppose from Emily Cook's point of view, what does one do? And she chose to cancel the the watch along to cancel the finale. And she issued this little statement in a, in a tweet. Over the past few months, the driving spirit behind the Doctor Who tweet along has been to bring fans together and to provide some much needed escapism and entertainment during lockdown. World well, enough in time, the Doctor Force was scheduled to be our Doctor Who lockdown finale on Saturday the 6th of June. After careful consideration, out of respect for the feelings of Doctor Who fans around the world, we won't be going ahead with the tweet along this weekend. It doesn't seem appropriate at this time. We do, however, have a brand new special feature to release The Best of Days, written by Stephen Moffat and starring Pearl Mackey and Matt Lucas. So she's very clear in what she said, and that was pretty much it. Emily took her leave of Twitter days later after uh, after a few more tweets in support of, of, uh, of the charities that they'd been raising money for with Doctor Who Lockdown and for the people involved in Doctor Who Blackout. And that was pretty much it so yes it did feel that although you know we've spoken about how the entire season took on a different tone once Paul Cornell had gotten involved this really did end it with a bit of a whimper really and and it felt like mm. an apology as somebody was leaving leaving a room it, it a great shame and a bit of a damp squib and as if attention was being passed on elsewhere and I'm not saying that other causes and other other charities certainly not aren't worthwhile too but I, I personally don't see see the issue in this I'm glad that I wasn't the one in the position don't get me wrong but um, I think it's a great shame as we reflect back on this time the fact that it ended like that I think it will always always be seen as a bit of a, of a shame what do you think Sarah I mean you, you were looking back now with three or four months on does this all seem like the dim and distant past to you 
Yeah, it's just interesting how we have just kind of moved on. I I understand Emily's decision. I personally don't agree with it. I think more than ever that the the more real life intervenes, the more you need that escapism. And, you know, the, the statement she said was, you know, it was some Doctor Who fans, not just Doctor Who fans. Very small amount of Doctor Who fans. Uh, yeah, small but vocal, unfortunately. I. It would have been nice for it to have gone out with a bang, but again, like you say, with Poco and Atlantics, it did sour it a little bit. I don't think it quite rallied as much as we did, but then maybe it couldn't. I mean, she started with Day of the Doctor, you know? <laughs> Where do you go? <laughs> yeah, I do feel like point. it, and it. I think it really did peak when they did Stolen Earth and Journey's End and they got RTD involved. Um, so maybe nothing was going to live up um, to that experience, but... Oh. I love the episode Thin Ice, by the way. I think it's fantastic. I do. I, I, I really it. like it's, that it's story. It's another strong... Um... It's okay. I mean, it's, like, it's not in the same category at all with uh, you know, World Enough and Time and Doctor no. Falls. No. no. Like, not even close. But, uh, I think it was, it was more about the message of that episode with it being about racism and what the Twelfth Doctor did. Again, I, I don't like it being used for messages and things and, you know, being put to a side. Um, but, yeah, but generally, overall, I, I did enjoy the experience. It was it was really rallying. And it gave you something to look forward to because, you know, you, you were getting excited. You were looking forward to Doctor Who every week. Oh, what's the next one going to be? Yeah. What's Emily going to choose? Oh, she's going to get in. And, and you got a chance to interact with people. Yeah. And it was exciting. I hope they do this story next. Oh, maybe this. Oh, maybe that. It was that. just so much fun. It was just so much fun. Yeah, that's the, that's just, the... And the suddenness of it, it was just like having a big massive balloon and then it just being popped. And that, <laughs> and that was it. Um, but, because yeah. nowadays we are spoilt, aren't we? Because we can. It's not like the days of the five faces of Doctor Who where it's, oh my God, they're repeating the Crotons. We can watch these stories anytime we like. And, and so that's... That convenience, that, you know, I wouldn't say we take the show for granted, but it, it is all at our fingertips. So this novelty value was, uh, I know I see the initiative, and I know it was a sort of a one-off thing originally, but sometimes the simplest ideas are the best. I think that this will be remembered by generations of fans for years to come. I think yeah, it, probably. It did, end, it did end, unfortunately. We have got a last statement that Emily Cook put out here. Lockdown has proven that we are better together that we're resilient enough to get through tough times, that there is always hope. So you can continue to muddle through this thing called life, go forward in all your beliefs, run fast, laugh hard, and always be kind. Very nice. Hey, look, have yeah. a look. She's a good writer. She knows what she's writing. And it's just a sh- I mean, listen, the, the way it ended is, so 2020, it's very sad. It's, uh, it's de- de- genuinely sad. The fun police. Yeah, well, but, happiness yeah, patrol. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> you know, like I hope hope something else comes along out of the blue like this did, Be nice. and like brings us back together again. Because I don't see anything. I mean, like people are just so entrenched and so angry. The problem is that the um, the current era is just not not very popular. You know, and it's just uh, the phrases that and and everybody knows it. And I listen on, on one of my live streams. I showed her a clean a PG thirteen <laughs> clip from a, a an X rated Doctor Who uh, a parody. In which okay. the Dalek says, That's you're bold. not getting any ratings. That's bad. <laughs> oh when you're parodies, I'm making fun of you. I Brett, saw you share So they're, they're, it's not doing well. And I understand they get very upset. They do get very upset. And I guess us saying we hate it all the mm-hmm. time makes them feel like we hate them. But we don't. I don't know why they you think know what? we do. She we did a good doctor. Mm-hmm. It was fine. I can see why they cast her. I thought she, I thought she was pretty good. I wouldn't have to see this now. Yeah. But yeah, I, th- I think this, this was... The um, unwanted side effect of this lockdown who thing was that it just proved that there's still that appetite and audience for good Doctor Who. Yeah, there is. And it really, oh, boy, there and is. And especially when BBC America just completely misjudged it and they just fell off a cliff with their suggestions. Again, it, it just reiterated that fact, you know, we don't, we want good Doctor we want this era Doctor we don't want current era. I, I can't imagine 2020... Honestly, 2017 to 2020, it's just like everyone's going to go, oh, my God, really? That's what life was like? Yeah, <laughs> believe, yeah believe it or not. 
the, the dark ages of really entertainment is. and culture. <laughs> oh, it really is. It really is. Well, Lockdown Who in particular, it originally worked like a charm and it proved the real worth of the Doctor Who fan base when, when something does appear that brings us together. And the, I think it helped focus for a little while on the true appeal of the show, the true appeal. I say that again, the true appeal. It's, it's mythology and the generosity of the cast and the crew passed despite those who uh, still claim that they, they don't get it. I want to ex- express my heartfelt pride gratitude for that time pride in the in the doctor who community and gratitude to everybody involved in making all that extra content and just organizing it and and rallying everybody really so thank you so so much emily everybody and uh, yeah i want to remind you that doctor who lockdown was and is raising funds for the covid19 film and tv emergency relief fund that's the BFI's film and television charity. The whole community coming together to support the industry's creative community during those unprecedented times. That closes the book on the lockdown era for us. Or does it? We shall see. Maybe there'll be a Christmas special. <laughs> we don't uh, know. It's well, there is going to be, it's, it's going to be a special at some point. Maybe it'll be a lockdown kind special. Of it's the only about the only content BBC have ready to go. I want Emily to Emily and the gang to produce a lockdown special too, a proper proper special <laughs> we well, shall they're, they're talking see. about uh colin bacon wants to do another five-ish doctors reboot does, doesn't it get colin out that's what i say for now thank you both for joining in i'll be back of course with some more type 40 very soon look out for that wherever you found this it could have been on apple podcasts if you simply search for the fandom podcast network over on apple podcasts you can drop us a review while you're there just so new listeners can find us that bit easier. It helps a lot more than you think. We're also on iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Play, the Podbean app, and Spotify. Just search for the Fandom Podcast Network. All our listings drop down so easily, even I can use it. And if there's anything you want to say to any of us, you can do so directly. Email type40doctorwho at gmail.com, Twitter and Instagram at type40doctorwho. There's that Facebook page and our lively Facebook group for any real time extra dimensional chit chat you want to have i can be found scattered through all of space and time but mostly on twitter as the space book where i talk about whatever catches my eye imagination or both in popular culture inside or outside of the tardis rabbi you're freaking awesome we established this earlier on in the whole i can't argue with you when you're right (laughs) but for the benefit of those who may not have seen your content where can people find you and all of that on social media easiest players places go to biblicalcomics.com B I B L I C A L C O M I X dot com. There's a link to my YouTube channel. You get a bunch of comic books there as well. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. And you have links to all my my, my social media. I just joined Parlor. Uh, so look up Rabbi from Another Planet. I'm just having a having a look around. It seems seems fine to me. And yes, we're going to drop in the epilogue to your epilogue as well. Don't forget, people are going to want to sample that. Listen along Fine, to that. I will send the link, of course. After the build-up, that's going to be fantastic. Sarah, is there anything you'd like to plug? Anywhere you'd like to send people? Oh uh, yeah, well, I've just joined Parlor as well. I was trying to get off social media, but then people kept wanting me back and wanting to get in touch with me. So I've started there, and that's uh, Starry Eyed Girl, so come and find me there. I've just beat... I did. I did. I found you, <laughs> Rabbi. I did find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also I was recently on a lovely YouTube channel called Lucky's Mornings of Mischief. I stepped out of the TARDIS and I was discovering the movie legend. And I also need to do a quick plug for my wonderful friends, the Valkyries, Purple Valkyrie and Samantha Joe, they've got a wonderful channel called Rise and Shine, the Valkyries. And they do some really different content there. They've just been doing some fantasy. They've been looking at dragons and folklore. And it's just, yeah, something really different. So, yeah, please check that out. I like the Valkyries. It's a fun channel. It really really is. It's a little bit bit different. It's It's, it's a different voice in there. I like it a lot. Just goes off the rails. And it's just, it's hilarious, yeah. Well, what I like about those girls is they know their flora and fungi and all their all their sort of mythology and things like they that do. and paganism. It's absolutely fascinating. And I understand they've extended a uh, invitation to the pair of us, haven't they, Sarah, to go and, and muck about with them and find yeah, out a little indeed, bit more. Yeah. So I'm look looking forward, forward to, that. to it. Ooh, I think that about covers it. Thanks again, both, and thanks to you for listening. Join us again next time here on the Fandom Podcast Network for another episode of Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast where we always have the time if you have the space. Thank <music> you.